Okay, so as you can probably see on the screen, we're talking about standardized surveys and the techniques were invented originally with something called transects, just to say that the, the two systems are really very, very similar. But the trouble with transects is that because people can cite them wherever they wish, people tend to cite them in the very best places to see lots of rare butterflies. And it gives a slightly misleading impression about how the butterflies of this country are doing. So a second system was created a bit later after yeah. transects were first created. And this second system chooses squares at random through the British countryside. So you might get somewhere that's a supermarket car park and you might get a hillside that's quite good. It's just a matter of luck. But it does mean we get a more realistic um, a view of what's going on out there. So the, the real beauty of it is that these two systems, the transect system and the WCBS or Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey Systems, they both collect standardized data, which allows them to be compared. It allows you to compare one site over a number of years to see how it's changing, or between two sites, because one might have different management or be in a different part of the country. So you can make really good comparisons between sites without having to worry that at one site, it might be that someone spent all day searching really hard, and at the other site, somebody just popped in for a few minutes and then left again. So it's excellent data. And it all goes into the UK BMS, which is the United Kingdom's Butterfly Monitoring Scheme data set, which BC, Butterfly Conservation, then hand on to the all these acronyms, the CEH, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and they create reports for the government. And the government, believe it or not, they do seem to notice that this information comes in. They do act on it when it suits them, perhaps it's not too rude a statement. But not just our government, the, as it says here, the European Union use it as well because they haven't got anything like the same data collection of insect groups in most of Europe. So they use our data. And if we say to them, it looks like doing a certain thing with hedgerows helps, then they adopt that as a policy. And I, I'm not joking, it really does have that effect. So not only is going out and collecting this data quite good fun, and on a, a pleasant day when there's quite a bit to see, it's absolutely brilliant, but it's rewarding for us and for all sorts of other people because the data is used. And one way that it can be used, which might appeal to you to, to know about this, I don't suppose, that the squares we're walking are under any great threat at the moment, but developments can be halted by records of rarer, scarcer butterflies. So things do flow from us going out and counting these butterflies, apart from just collecting data, they actually have a knock-on effect that's really worthwhile. And there are basically three types of standardized surveys. As I said, transect walks came along first, Wider countryside butterfly surveys are the ones we're looking at tonight. And there is also something called a reduced effort or single species survey, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that today. So what do we need? If we're going to go out on one of these sort of walks, what do we need? Well, here we are, pen. We've got, I'm not going to read it all to you. You can read this for yourself, but I am going to talk about this, the thermometer. Now, if you if you drive a car, you might notice that Sometimes your car tells you that it's a bit warmer than the weather forecast predicted it would be. And you might notice that if you then do look at a thermometer that's hanging somewhere in the shade, your car's temperature and the shade temperature are not the same. The car is usually warmer. Remember that your car is driving along a black tarmac road usually in the sun because you tend to go off to do your surveys in better weather and the road heats up so the thermometer inside your car might well be in a shady spot but the heat coming up from the road surface pulls it into thinking it's slightly warmer so i'm not suggesting for one moment you should never use the thermometer in your car i am suggesting you should know how much the sun affects that thermometer and how the sun shining on the road makes it 
overestimate how warm it is because we want to know the shade temperature, which means the shade temperature in vegetation. So that's just something worth pointing out, I think. Quite a lot of people say, well, I've got a thermometer in the car. Yes, but it isn't as accurate as a thermometer in the vegetation would be. And you can make an allowance for it if you measure it one day to find out how much your car exaggerates. Okay, you're going to need some suitable clothing. You don't need me to explain that in the British weather, that could be all sorts of different things on different days. And then the optional bits. Now, one of these, which is a bit contentious, is the net. Most of the people on whose land we're walking, they've agreed to a surveying and using a net will not be a problem. It could be that you have ethical reasons that you say you don't want to use it because you're afraid you might hurt the insects. And I can't deny it is possible that you will, but it's very rare actually that you damage an insect by netting it. And all you're going to do is catch it because then it sits still for a little while, which gives you a chance to identify it clearly before you release it again. I know some people who walk the WCBS um, surveys, they take a net with them and they find it very helpful. I take a net with me, I do transect rather than WCBS. I couldn't do it without because so many butterflies would whiz past me without me knowing what they were otherwise. I'd strongly suggest you take a charged phone. You never know when you're going to need to call someone. So that's definitely helpful. And for those of you that find reading a list a bit dull, but pictures better, here's the same information in picture form. So here's what we're going to take with us. Depending on how you like to record things, you could have your pen and paper, or you could record everything in that charged phone because phones are very good at recording things. I would suggest you want to take a map because let's suppose for some reason your phone stops working and you get lost, a map is helpful. If you've never been to this particular spot before, then I would say take a map. If you've been a few times and you don't really think it's possible you get lost, then that's that's OK. But to begin with, it's a good idea. Binoculars, because a butterfly might fly close to you and you should be recording it, but you don't work out exactly what it is. And then it settles at some distance rather than walking over to it. You can usually look at it through binoculars and get a very good idea. If it's too far away for binoculars, then I'm afraid it's gone. You've got to let it go. Um, I put glasses in because I don't know what you're like. I can look at butterflies around me and identify them. But then when it comes to writing on the piece of paper where I'm supposed to be writing the detail, the small boxes into which I'm supposed to write are a bit of a challenge because my eyesight's failing at the reading end. So I have reading glasses with me as well. A camera might be useful because you might see something you can't be sure what it is and you can take a picture, identify it later. And this is supposed to represent an identification guide of some sort. But to be perfectly honest, it's very hard to use that when you're walking a survey because you're not supposed to stop and look everything up. It means you'll take forever to get around if you do that. And here we're suggesting think about your own comfort take a drink, take something to eat. If you think you're going to want it, then by all means, take it along. What you don't want to do is to carry so much stuff that the whole thing becomes a real burden. So take the least possible to do a good job. OK, so how are we going to do all this walk? No one's interrupted me yet, so I'm going to carry on. But please call out if there's anything you want to say. What about this? What about that? Now, we suggest that if you're going out to do your wider countryside walks, that you go at least twice a year. And in fact, we'd say that was not really enough. So it is feasible to do these WCBS squares and get what's referred to as a valid result by going just in July and August. But we don't recommend that. In fact, we discourage it. We would like you to go in May. June, both early and late July, because you might well get different species, and again August. So we'd like five visits, but we understand not everybody can always make five. So we're asking that you should try to do five walks. The, if you look at the WCBS information online, you'll find that they say two visits is enough, but we're hoping you'll manage to get five in. Did you want to come in on that, Nick? 
Yeah, thanks, Nick. Just to clarify, so we've said in some of the other communications a monthly session, but the early and late July one is a good addition, Nick. But uh, so that as a core. But um, in, I guess in also if there if the conditions are right, and you have the time, um, a, an April and a September were nice to have as well, if you can. But I guess the core program is as as Nick's kind of set out in the the core flight months between May and um, May and August. So if that if that's if you've got any kind of queries, so that's not quite what I've sent out there that's that that's where we're at so may june the, the july ones if you can in august but april and september if you get time and you get the opportunity it's quite nice to wrap around but that's not the not the core program if that makes sense yeah i'm sorry nick i but there's yeah. absolutely no reason why people can't walk more often you could walk 10 times if you want it's just that when you go to the wcbs information which you might well visit then you'll see it does say two visits, but we don't like that. So I haven't realized that Nick had said once a month. I, I would suggest April's fine. You won't really see very much different um, between April and May. There'll be more things in May, fewer things in April, and everything that's flying in April will probably still be there in May. But give it a try. If you find different things, you'll know that Nick was right and you should have walked in April. Okay, let's move on. So there's plenty of information online. I'm not going to go into any of this. I'm just going to point to you that if you go to the UK BMS website, you can find this information and it's all helpful, but we're going to go through it now so that you shouldn't need to go through there and spend ages reading all that. This is the sort of thing it looks like, but again, I'm not doing it now. That's just to show you the sort of thing that is there. But I am going to go through this because this is important. So we'll assume for the moment that you've arrived in your square and you're about to start recording what you see. And on your first trip out, you might well be uncertain about what you're supposed to be recording. So let's just go through the, the form. And I think record is pretty obvious, isn't it? Grid rep. Now, it doesn't really matter what you put here, provided you know where you walk. So you could put the name of the site if you want. This is so that you know where you've been and when you get back and put it into the UK BMS, when you put this entry into the database, then you can look up and enter the proper grid ref. So they, they will need you to tell them the grid ref of your square at some point. But to be perfectly honest, you don't actually need to write it in there, provided you write clearly where you've been so that when you come to transfer this, you get the right information recorded for the correct site. Uh, what you'll find is that I think Nick has given all the sites a name, which is easier to remember, in my opinion, than a grid ref, but you do need to know the grid ref. Start Let's time. Jump, jump yep. in, Nick, sorry on that. Of so absolutely for filling the form in, but all your sites will be allocated to you on the UK BMS website. And I think we've pretty much worked that through with most of you now. So I guess when you go to enter your data, you will only have your square allocated to you or your squares allocated to you on the site yeah. when you go in. So, um, yeah, so the grid reference on the form, you absolutely need to know where you're at. Any queries on that, you're not quite sure which which number you're at, then shout. But um, that but should all right, be linked Nick. to your online accounts. No, you're absolutely right, Nick. When you log in at the UK BMS, it will show you the grid, the, the one kilometre square that you're recording. But I thought a few people might be doing more than one. And if they leave it a fortnight before they enter their data, they need to have made some reference here as to which square the data has been collected in, just in case they get confused when they look at the sheets. Anyway. Yeah, that's a good good shout. Yeah, time between doing your survey and your data. The sooner it goes online, the better you less, you forget less things. But yeah. Yep, absolutely. Start yeah, time. I, yeah, sorry. Interrupt? Yes, of course. Sorry, just I drive right, uh, switched on a bit late. Are these, is this uh, PowerPoint available after the, after the Zoom meeting? It's being recorded, Richard. Sorry? It's being recorded. Oh, it so is? This, this, okay. So you'll be able to watch this again. Um, I, I could, if you want, send you the PowerPoint afterwards, but the whole session is being recorded. Oh, fine. So we can download it separately afterwards. Yes. Yeah, it'll it'll go up on a, it'll go on our YouTube channel, Richard. So when it's up there, I'll better send the links through. So you better watch again. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. And now you'll, uh, be, on it. you'll be able to watch yourself now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you'll be in it. <laughs> a cameo 
Uh, um, start time and finish time, I'm going to talk about those a bit later, but that's, again, fairly obvious, isn't it? County, yes, okay, w we can guess where we are, and the date. That is important. Make sure you get the right date in there, please. Now, average temperature. This one is more complicated, and it needs to be filled in both mentally in your head before you start. You need to be certain you know what the temperature is. And it also needs checking at the end. And what you're supposed to record then is somewhere in the middle between the start and the end temperature. Before you start, the temperature should be above 13 degrees C. If it is 13, that's okay, but it'd be better if it was a bit higher. Any of you that do try and walk in April and May will discover that there are an awful lot of days when the temperature seems to hover around about 12 and never quite makes 13. So you might end up walking at the beginning when you set off it's 12, but you need to know that so that when you get to the end, you can look at the, the end temperature, know what your start temperature was and work out the average. I mean, it's pretty obvious, I suppose, but if I didn't say it, you might not think of it. You need to know the lowest and the highest temperature to work out the average. It's no good only looking at the temperature at the end and assuming that's the temperature it's been all the time. So the instructions are to record your average temperature by looking at the temperature at the end of the walk. But obviously, to get the average, you need to know what it was at the beginning. Wind direction. Now, again, you, you could find this online. I'm sure it will tell you that for that day, the wind is mostly from a particular direction. But you might have a site where you know the vagaries of the hillsides and woodlands around you mean that the wind is almost permanently from a particular direction. I would put down what you can tell the direction is, where you are that day. So it may be that the whole of the country is getting a westerly airflow, but it might be more southwest or northwest where you are. And I put that in personally. So it's what you're experiencing. Average wind speed, there's a tiny little bit of information I'm tiny in terms of the size of the text. We'll, we will go through that on Saturday because some people find that difficult. To be honest, it isn't, you'll get used to it. Um, wind direction and wind speed, they need filling in again at the end, but you, you could easily put the direction at the beginning by thinking about it before you start. It doesn't matter. I don't think the wind's going to change all that much in the time it takes to walk around. Is the majority of a survey classed as upland? Well, it, the Chilterns may be a bit higher than some of the vales around, but no. And the only reason they're asking that is that if you are somebody who's walking an upland survey, you're allowed to do it under slightly different conditions because they get a lot more bad weather in truly upland sites. But we are not, so we're not going to concern ourselves. And then we come to sunshine. Now, this is one of the things that, again, people who've not had any sort of training have just gone out and done it on their own often get wrong. Sunshine means the amount of time. So it's not percentage. And you think, well, it's hazy today, so I'll call that 30%. No, it's the amount of time that you have a shadow. So if you've got a shadow, even on a hazy day, that's 100% sun. If you're walking underneath a tree and therefore you haven't got a shadow, but the tree has a shadow, that's 100% sun. So you might be in the shade, but as far as the survey is concerned, it is sunny, if you see what I mean. If the, if the trees you're walking under do not have a shadow because the sun has gone behind the cloud and there are no shadows anywhere, then that is. 0% sun. So what you've got to estimate in each section, not for the whole thing, each section, as you walk that section, you've got to keep in mind, is the sun out? Have I got a shadow? Or has the sun gone in behind a cloud and I do not have a shadow? And then you write down the percentage. This is written down in 10% um, additions, so if it's only at the 10% of the time, obviously that's 10, but the next thing up would be 20, not 11 or 12. 
So you, you'd jump with a guesstimate of how many 10% of sun there were. And again, on Saturday, I hope we'll get a chance to do this. I did some training last week and we were talking about it before we started our walk. And the sun was out just in and out, in fact. And then we did our walk and it was in the whole time. So nobody managed to, to work out quite how to do this because we all got nothing, 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 nothing um, on our track practice walk. Anyway, that needs to be thought about as you're walking so that you can record each section separately. And I'm afraid it's one of the things, as I say, people quite often get wrong either because they completely forget till they get to the end of the walk and then suddenly think, oh my God, I should have been thinking about that. Or they've made the mistake of thinking when they go under a tree or by the side of a building, that they're going to record it as being no sun because they're in a shadow of a building or a tree, but that isn't what it means. It means, is the sun out or is the sun in? Okay. Uh, in each of these boxes, we're going to write down the number of the butterflies that we see inside the survey grid box, the survey five meter square box, which I will come to in a moment. And one last point, there are some versions of this survey form in existence, and I don't think any of you will have them, but some of the older forms, for reasons I can't even begin to guess, they put the sunshine at the bottom. So if you think to yourself, oh, well, there's no space on my sheet for recording the sunshine, it might be you've got somehow or another, you've managed to get one of the older versions, the sunshine is at the bottom. But these days, the more modern ones, they put it at the top to try and remind people to, to do it. So when do we walk? Uh, as I've said, the, the scheme itself nationally says, well, at least once in July and August. And notice this bit, please, 10 days apart. So you don't walk the last day of July and the first day of August if you can avoid it. But we would prefer Nick suggesting April. I'm saying May, early July, late July, August and Nick is saying it's a good idea to go in September as well. Obviously, the more often you go, the more species you're going to record. And we are trying to find out the total number of species on each site. So it's better to go more often. Um, the tracking the impact is doing a better job in some ways of getting people out there more often than the national scheme asks. But the national scheme was set up trying to make it as easy as possible to get people out there walking. So we would like you to try and do five walks, please. Here we are, five walks, but you can do more. You can do more. You can do as many as you like, really. You can go it every 10 days. You could go and do it again. Oops, sorry. Uh, walk between 10.45 and 3.45. Now that's the usual recommendation, but you should go out after 10.45 and walk and try and finish by 3.45 when the weather conditions are suitable. And we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. But it's obvious that with some days recently, the temperatures being way above 30, that isn't a very sensible thing to ask people to walk around in the middle of the day in the sun when it's over 30 degrees. So if it is particularly hot, and you know it's going to be tricky to do your walk because you're going to get too hot, then you can go out an hour earlier, 9.45, and you can finish an hour later, 4.45 or 16.45. So very hot weather, you can start a bit earlier or you can finish a bit later to try and avoid the, the, the worst of the heat and the strongest sun. So let's look at when are these weather conditions suitable. So here we are. Now, again, this is something you've got to try and estimate before you start. Do you expect to get at least 60% sun? If it's above 13, but not above 17. So if, it's, if you think to yourself, when you arrive on site, well, there's, there's quite a bit of sun. There's some cloud in the sky, but it's not gonna be too much. I should get the sun shining on me about 60% of the time, 
and the temperature at the minute is 13. I don't think it's going to get much hotter. It might go up to 15. That would be a day when you've got exactly the right sort of conditions to sort the envisaged when they set up the scheme. You're going to get mostly sunny and you're going to get temperatures averaging out 14, 15, something like that. If you go out in the summer, maybe in July, and it's already above 17, when you actually arrive on site, it's already above 17. You don't need to worry about how much sun there is. You can walk even if it's cloudy. So above 17 degrees C, you can walk in any conditions apart from as soon as it starts to rain, you're supposed to give up and try again a different day. So I'm, I'm hoping that's clear, but I realise it's beginning to be more and more information to take in. Nick, just a quick question, and I guess it's, it, it is obvious as to why that's the case, but um, the reason for the being really, the sounds like being really fussy on sun and on temperature is just it affects the activity of butterflies and your likelihood to see them. That's essentially the rationale for the, for the quite strict temperature regulations, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, quite a lot of butterflies won't fly until it is 13 degrees C and you're much more likely to spot them when they move. <coughs> so you might see some butterflies that are sitting still and don't move and you'll walk past them and they'll stay exactly where they are. But we tend not to spot those as easily as the ones that fly. And one of the reasons they've uh, given the stipulation we're about to look at very soon about the distance from you that you should be recording is that at that distance, you'll probably scare things up if the temperature is above 13, they will fly because you will disturb them, and that helps you to spot them and get a, a more accurate record of what's there. So we, we're standing at the beginning of our walk. We've looked at the sky. We've looked at a thermometer. We've decided the sky hasn't got too much cloud. We're expecting it to be sunny at least 60% of the time. The temperature is already 13, so it's good to go. The only other thing we've got to worry about is the wind. So I did say to you, you ought to look at the wind before you start, because if it's above five on the Beaufort scale, and that's pretty blowy, then you shouldn't walk, because most butterflies don't like to fly around when it's very windy. But you'll see far fewer than you should do on a, a reasonable day in the same place. So it skews the results. Some species are much more affected by the wind than others and much less likely to fly if it's above five. So we don't walk if it's very windy, even if it's a beautiful sunny day and quite warm. If it's too windy, you shouldn't walk. Now, what do we mean by walk? It, all, it, it is genuinely, when you try this, it's actually quite a simple thing to do, but because I say so much, it sounds like it's complex. It's not. Walking means a steady pace. And it's a slow pace. Because most people start walking their survey in the spring, possibly in April or May, they don't see very much and they tend therefore to walk a bit faster because there's nothing to record. But in the middle of the summer, when there are lots of species and each species needs to be identified correctly and the numbers need to be counted correctly, you'll have to go much more slowly. So you should try to start at a slow pace and to keep that same steady pace right round through all of the sections on the wall. And the next bit, if possible, you only stop to write down what you've seen and to have a drink or a bite of something to eat if you want at the end of the section. At that point, that's when you write down the amount of time, the percentage of time, that the sun was shining. So if you do go out in April, I think it's going to be very easy to walk a section 200 metres and write down what you saw at the end, because the chances are you'd have seen one or possibly two butterflies in that 200 metres and you won't forget. But in the summer, when you might walk 200 metres and see 300 butterflies, there's an absolute probability that you will forget what you've seen. So you will need to stop if you've got those sorts of numbers. Every now and again, you'll have to stop and write down what you've seen up to that point. And then at the end of the, the section, do a total to get the, the section's totals. Now, you'll be pleased to hear that you're doing wider countryside butterfly survey 
with ten sections because transects look they've got no limits at all. And some people who are really keen when they set up their transects make them enormous, and they end up walking virtually all day to do their transect. The good thing about the wider countryside butterfly survey is that your ten sections add up in total to approximately two k. So it should be possible to walk right around, the, right around the whole thing, record everything in an hour or so. Should be about an hour. You can go yeah, very slowly. I, yeah, sure. Um, how are the 200 metres measured? Uh, by measuring 200 metres. We'll look at this again on Saturday, but they are 200 metres. That's how you know you got to the end of the 200 metres. So, so basically, the, it's, already pre, it's already measured out in advance. Uh, can I, no. <laughs> can I jump in? Or are you going to get you going to I'll, I'll come in after you. Yeah. OK, so what you do, Richard, assuming that you're taking on a, a square that no one else has ever walked. You go there before the season starts or before the day that you're going to record your first things and you set off at point zero and you go 200 metres and then you look around to see if you can see something that will remind you next time, this is where I stop and write down my first section. That's um, I understand, but are we taking a metre as a pace? I mean, I'm wondering how, mm. how you judge 200 metres, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, that's by looking at the map, you draw it onto a map. Oh, right, okay, that's fine, I understand now. Yeah, yeah. Richard, yeah. I, I, all this kind of stuff, one, one thing from today, so you, you've got your squares allocated, one thing we need to do is then look at, so after Saturday, we'll be able to sit down and I'll be able to help you with it, is to look at the map and work out your route. So there's all kinds of things we need to factor in around footpaths and access. And, and once it's in, it goes online to the UK BMS website. And that's when it says this section is 220 metres and we can thin it or we can. So don't don't worry too much, but we can, I can help you with all that after, after no Saturday. Problem. I understand now, yeah, that's fine. Good. Yeah, no, good question, no, good question. You, you keep asking, Richard, because I bet, if you're thinking it, so are other people, and they're, they're just not asking because they haven't got your courage. But you're quite right to ask. And as Nick said, you might get to the end of your 200 metres on the first time you walk through this bit and think, well, there's a gate there 10 metres further on. Why don't I go to the gate? The answer is you do. You can make a section just a bit more or a bit less okay. so that there's an obvious end. But unfortunately, there will be occasions when you're just in the middle of an anonymous bit of countryside with no obvious marker. And then you've perhaps got to find some way of marking it. Um, I tried this at a site where I walk by leaving a stick on the floor. That didn't, didn't last long, a dog walker, I suspect, for, it, for their dog. And that, that was the end of my marker there. I had to just remember where I was by looking at hedgerows and things around me. So right. no one's going to come out later and say to you, you've gone five metres too far or something, but it's supposed to be 200 metres as close as you can make it. OK, fine. Okay. Thanks. And the, the next bit about two parallel rows, because you walk away from your starting point for your kilometre, five sections of 200, and then you come back five different sections of 200. So you get back to where you started approximately. Now, this last bit, it's a bit controversial, this, and I'm not entirely sure about this myself. I do agree with this sentiment that it's best to go on your own, or at least to be the only person who's surveying. What can happen, I've seen this with people be, being out there surveying with a friend, and the friend keeps telling them that they've missed things, or asking them if they remember what they're doing next weekend when they've both agreed to go somewhere. So they tend to get either an inflated record because they've walked past something and that's going to happen to everyone, but the person they're with has spotted it and tells them that they just walked past a butterfly they didn't record. Well, their temptation then, of course, is to add it on the grounds that oh, I'm an idiot, I should have seen that, I'll put it in. But you shouldn't because the whole scheme is set up so that one person is doing the recording and they will make some mistakes. They will walk past things. We all do. But if everyone is recording what they see and not what three other people who are helping them tell them they've missed, then we get a much more valid comparison of 
the, the one person's results. So if, if you are going to walk with other people, that's absolutely fine. As long as you ask them, please don't tell me what you've seen or start talking to me about something else when I'm just trying to work out whether that was 16 meadow browns and 15 ringlets or the other way around. So try and do it a single person recording what they see. I mean, I must say, there's a sort of methodological issue here, isn't there? Because an experienced watcher, I know from as a birder, will actually see more than an inexperienced one. So <laughs> early on, you know, two eyes are better than one, theoretically. But if you're an exper very experienced butterfly watcher, then you may actually well spot more butterflies because you're, you're more, you know, attuned to it. Just an observation, really. It's true. But it, luckily, there are, just like with birds, there are tens of thousands of people out there recording and so it smooths out over the numbers of people. So, yes, when you start, I'm sure you will record less. Absolutely certain you will record less. Um, I know that I record less than some people because I won't record anything unless I'm absolutely certain. And there are some people who say, well, I think it was that. I'm 90% sure I'll put it down. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you do get differences between people. But the numbers of people involved mean that that isn't statistically it's not a problem. You wanted Nick, to come I, in as well, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, just coming on that, and it's a really important we raised, Richard. There, and I guess it's the difference between um, going out there and trying to build as big a list as you possibly can of every species you've caught, and surveys. Surveys work really well when you're consistently repeating all the way through. So it may well be that I'm half as good a butterfly identifier as Nick. Um, Nick will find more, but the key thing is I'm consistent in what I do. So I'm consistently recording and therefore it's change you're looking at and trends if you're looking at on that front, as opposed to building a big list. So I guess that's a very clumsily, badly way um, of saying surveying is a very different discipline and different purpose to going out there and building a kind of a list, if you like. Um, and I guess second point, I look back at my own bird surveys 20 years ago and I was recording 21, 22 species on my square, and now I'm averaging kind of 38, 40. That's why it's inevitable that things will grow and you'll improve and you'll, you'll develop. Um, the flip side, if, so if we waited till everybody was at a certain level, we'd never get any survey data done. So I guess there's a really key point here about even if we go out there and we get 10, 15 species, that's 10, 15 species we didn't know about in your square than we knew before. So it's all building this evidence base, this database, this data set. So I'm clumsily saying, don't worry about it. As so long as you're consistent in what you do and you build things up, so long as you're at a kind of a basic level of competence, you will improve, you will see more. But the key thing is repeating the consistency of data and the consistency of method. Um, yep, absolutely. It's all about doing it by the rules, as it were, and re recording what you see. Um, you'll notice I've moved on to another slide, which is the, the ones which are currently unadopted, that, that they have nobody to walk them. So if you recognize the names of these places, these are mostly in the Chilterns towards the northern edge. And these are mostly around the Chess Valley. They're not entirely. But anyway, you might recognize the names of some of those places and think, oh, I could perhaps have a look at that. That's why I put the list up here, because these are most of them. Anyway, I think Nick said a couple of them might be gone, right? But these are ones which are still looking to be adopted. That list isn't going to stay there for long, but it's it's all available for you to look at on the website that Nick has created, where you can look to see what has been recorded on the squares which are adopted, and you can also see which squares still remain to be adopted. Um, whereabouts are the walks? Well, I just did that really, didn't I? I should have put this slide before the other one. That's a bit of a mistake. Um, but the point is that these slides are allocated randomly, so you can't just decide this looks like a nice spot, why don't we do our walks there? I'm afraid they're all allocated randomly, deliberately to avoid people saying this is a nice spot, I'll do my walk there. And outside the Chilterns, although I noticed this one right on top of the Chilterns ANOB, but a O N B. I always get that one. The there are a whole load of other. If you feel once you've taken these on, you'd like to spread your wings. There are a load more squares 
across our region which are not part of tracking the impact but don't worry nick i'm not poaching <laughs> now this is the bit richard was asking about a minute ago i think in terms of well how do you know when it's 200 meters what we have here first of all if we look at this left hand square this is an idealized one kilometer square and it's wcbs survey route so you start here and you walk the 200 meters and then you stop that's the end of section one and you write down what you've seen how much sunshine there was and then you begin again and go through section two and stop after now 400 meters and then you go on and there's 600 meters 800 meters one kilometer stop move 500 meters and come back but of course the chances that you're going to find yourself in a landscape that allow that's pretty slim and these squares on the right show us things which are more likely so here is a sort of a not quite perfect example because it's got a bit of a kink in it but it's still good this is actually very good if you find something as good as that in the square you've been given then you're very lucky because quite often they're much more difficult so here we've got a, a path that goes out in this direction and then one that comes back parallel to it approximately that's good in this case as you can see there's supposed to be a lake here so this square looks like it will never work i think it's correct you're not going to find a situation like that in the squares which are being offered within tracking the impact. But in some parts of the UK, there are squares like that. This square and like the one above it there, this one at the bottom right here, you can see that they don't quite get to the edge because you've only got to walk a kilometre. And because of the bend, that means you get your kilometre in before you reach the edge. So you obviously still have to find your way out to come back the other way, but you don't record the extra bit. You only record the kilometre. And similar thing here, where neither one of these two routes actually makes it quite as far as the edge because of the slightly wiggly shape of them. So when you get your square, the one that you've chosen or the one that's been allocated to you, you'll have to take a look at the map and see where are the footpaths, where are the tracks, where are the roads? And if you know the landowner, you might be able to say, where is there a, a margin around the field that I could walk and I could then fit in my two one kilometer lengths broken into five 200 meter lengths. So they can be tricky and you might find that you can't get the whole two kilometers into one square for various reasons, road, a building, whatever it is. And you might need to slightly encroach into a, an adjacent square to get the full length, but that's permissible. So if there is some hazard or obstacle, then it is permissible to extend into an adjacent square. But if you can avoid it, that's best. Um, this basically says what I've just said there that sometimes you can't do it, it's not possible or it isn't safe, and then those squares will be removed. As soon as that's reported to the people who organise all this centrally, they will say, okay, that's obviously not a square that's ever going to work, so we'll give you a different square. Minor intrusions into the adjacent squares are possible. Sometimes it's the only practical way, but you have to make sure when you record the route that you are making it clear to the UK BMS people that you are actually walking slightly outside. But there's nothing wrong with that as long as they know about it. Um, Richard, because of the question he brought up, has already had me to say this, really, that you want to go there before the day you do your first recording to make sure you know where you're going and approximately where each 200 metre section ends. And the last one is saying, don't do it if for any reason you're not happy, it, it says threatened. But if for any reason you're not happy about your square, then please don't walk it. We don't want anyone doing this who isn't enjoying it. I find doing all this surveying, and obviously lots of other people do, really enjoyable. 
but you shouldn't walk around a square if at any point you're not enjoying it. If you think that you know, there's somebody who walks a dog there and their dog is a threat, don't go. If you think that crossing a road, which is in the middle of your square, is putting your life at risk, don't go. Please don't do these squares if there's a threat. But I can assure you that almost all the squares are completely safe. So and we, it's just something that we feel we ought to say that we are very keen that people go out there, collect useful data, but have fun doing it. Now, this is the, one of the bits that quite a lot of people struggle with about where do I record? And because many butterflies are tiny, you are only supposed to record at a distance of up to five meters ahead of yourself. And that's quite a long way for a very small butterfly, I think. But anyway, that's what the scheme says. So five meters ahead, anything that flies through this imaginary box up to five meters ahead. So it might come in at 4.9 centimeter, 4.9 meters in front of you and fly across and disappear this side, but that still counts. Anything which is 2.5 meters either side of you and up to five meters above you. Now that doesn't mean five meters above your head. It's five meters from the ground. And believe me, most of us are getting on for two meters tall, aren't we? Anything that's three meters above you flying in the sky is going to be pretty difficult to identify. It's, it's going to be silhouette, isn't it? Usually. So that's really difficult. Added to which, of course, you're trying to walk along here, probably across a footpath or something similar, trying not to fall over. So it is very difficult to look above. And the people who organise this scheme are well aware that butterflies that fly about very high are under-recorded. They know that and they make allowances for it when they look through the data. So you have to imagine when you're walking that you're in this imaginary box and you're recording anything that comes into this imaginary box up to five meters ahead, two and a half meters either side and up to five meters from the ground. You can, and it might be that this is exactly what you'll need to do on your WCBS walk. Walk so that you're only one meter from a hedge over here because that's where the footpath is and you can't see through the hedge. So you can then record three and a half meters on this side. So the total distance, five meters. And it also might be that where you're walking, you've got a hedge on both sides. And if the hedge on both sides is only four meters, well, that's what you'll have to record because you can't see through it. But if it was six meters, a bit like I was saying that if you've got your 200 meters to the end of your section, but you can see a gate just a little bit further on, and that's a more sensible place to walk to, that's fine. And the same with this. If you can record two and a half meters either side, easily do it. But if the distance between a hedge on either side is actually six meters, and you feel confident looking at butterflies three meters on either side of you, then you can do that because it's an obvious, easy way to make sure you record the same every time to do between the two hedges. So I hope that's clear. You should go and try to keep everything within the five meters ahead, five meters either side and five meters above the ground. But there will be times when you have to use common sense and say, well, I can't see five meters both sides, there isn't a space. Or I can see five meters both sides, but I can actually see a little bit more. I'm gonna record the lot because it's easier than trying to work out if something is you know, just a little bit outside my box. Because there's an obvious marker there, I'll do that width between two hedges. But your, your own square will dictate this to you. This is the idealized thing that you're aiming at. But if for some reason on your particular set, uh, walk, one of the sections makes this difficult, then you can adapt it slightly, provided you always do the same thing every time. So you shouldn't change it at different times of the year or different weather. Now, this bit is also 
something that people say, well, surely not, but you should only count the butterflies that you can identify 100% accurately. This means that you will not record every butterfly you see. And people often say to me, well, that's ridiculous. So this butterfly's there, and you know they're there because you've seen them, but you're not writing anything down. That's correct. It isn't. Nick already said this. This isn't some sort of competition to see who can record the most. It's an exercise to correctly identify what's there and compare that data over the years and with other sites and so on. So we're only interested in things which can absolutely for certain be identified. Um, one species group which suffers badly are the whites. It is very, very difficult to identify the whites when they fly past you. So you're going to under count. There will definitely be a, a low score for whites compared with what's really there. It's just not possible to identify them, I'm afraid. And you never count a butterfly that flies from behind you. And again, people say, well, hang on a minute. Suppose I'm walking along and the only blue butterfly I see that day is a holly blue that flies from behind me. Surely I, surely I should include that because it's the only one. It can't be that I've counted it before. No, I'm sorry. The rules say you don't count it. We're not trying to get the biggest number of butterflies recorded. We're trying to get an accurate and valid count. So everybody works the same rules and that makes it valid. You can compare them one person's with another. And the reason we say you never count one that flies from behind you is that in the summer, a whole load of stuff's going to go past you and then turn around and come back. <laughs> so try not to double count, but it's impossible to know what's happened behind you. So you can't tell if a butterfly flew past you and then turned around and came back. So you just don't count anything that comes from behind. And obviously, I think you don't count anything that's outside this box, the imaginary five metre wide box. Difficult species. Now, this is, again, if you are one of those people who's prepared to take a net, this is a bit easier, but it isn't easy. What they suggest is that you walk your, your survey, and then if there were some difficult species that you weren't quite sure what they were, but you'd like to try to record them accurately, you could go back into your survey site and you could catch a few and see what they were. Um, that doesn't work awfully well for whites because they've gone. By the time you get to the end of your section, the whites have left because they just keep moving, don't they? It works quite well for smaller Nessex skipper, but I think this is fairly hopeless advice, actually. I think Difficult species are difficult species, and you're probably not going to be able to go back and do much about it. You, you can try, and I don't know, you know, obviously, if you want to try, I'm just saying, please don't be upset. If you get to the end of your section and you've seen some butterflies, but you haven't been able to identify them, that's what happens to all of us. People at the very beginning think, well, everybody else must be doing this much better than me because I've, I've seen eight butterflies, but I've only recorded five. That is normal. That is normal. Um, point that I made earlier about the single recorder. Okay, sunshine estimated per section in 10% increments. If you can see your shadow, it's sunny. So this is a summary, if you like. Temperature taken in the shade. Usually noted, I've put at walk's end, but by which I mean, do you write down the average temperature at the walk's end? But you had to know what it was at the beginning. You have to check that it meets the minimum minimum requirements before you start. Wind speed is the maximum on any part of the walk. So if you go through a woodland as part of your walk, it may well be quite sheltered. But if you then walk out onto a hillside and it's really blowy, that's the bit you write down, the blowy bit. Because we want to know that at, at no point did it ever get above five on the Beaufort scale. And they want to know the direction as well, remember. So some of you might walk a transect. I have no idea. But if you do, you'll be pleased to hear that these two systems are so similar. They both walk a fixed route at a slow, steady speed. 
They both identify butterflies inside your imaginary five meter square box. They both say you only count things you identify for certain. They both ask you that you should only count in the appropriate weather conditions as we've described. Between 10.45 and 15.45, unless it's very warm, that you have to record all these conditions and you have to register initially and then upload all the records as soon as you can to the UK BMS website. So that if you do one of these, you can do the other one easily. They are effectively using the same system. Um, why have I got that there? I'm not sure. We're not going to try and steal any. Here we are. This is. Sorry, can I just ask you know, a quick yeah, yeah, question? Please do. Please do. Um, if you're out on your walk and you're halfway through it and it suddenly becomes too windy, what do you do? You abandon it completely and start again another day or? Uh, yes, I suppose. Yeah, I think you should. Uh, the best thing would be to, to abandon and start again a different day. The same if it starts raining. OK, fine. You know, if you set off, if the weather forecast said it was going to be a reasonable day. You set off, it looks there's some cloud in the sky, but it doesn't look as if it's going to be a problem. And then suddenly it starts to sling it down. You have to abandon and go back on a different day, I'm afraid. It's just one of those things that does happen in the British countryside. Sure, makes sense. Thanks. Okay. So, recording your results. Well, we've been through about the form. So, we know that we're, you know, we're, we're just going to put all our results then on that paper form. But there is a bit more to it than that because people are going to see butterflies which are outside their five metre box. And that, again, people say, well, surely if I've seen it, I should record it. So, you may record things outside the box, just not as part of this survey return, which recorded separately. But everything that is on your sheet, everything that is on your sheet, when you get to the UK BMS website where you've registered, this is the page where you'll start putting things in. And you can see I've started filling this one in. So personally, I'm doing the moths as well. I'm not doing the dragonflies because I'm sorry, but I'm just not good enough at dragonflies. So I personally do add not just butterfly records, but also moth records. I don't do dragonflies. I do record the amount of sun and temperature and all the rest of it. Um, and these are obviously silly numbers, one in 10, but I just stuck them in because I had to put something in the form before it would let me go on and finish it. So that's the first page you see when you enter that you're going to record your data and then it takes you through to this page and as you see at the top here look the butterflies are the things that come up as a default but then you can choose moths odonata dragonflies and other things too but anyway in each of the sections you're going to write down the amount of sun i just put one in every one of those because that's what i put on the other page and this will this part of the form will populate automatically with what you put on the other side, but you might need to change it for some of the sections because it's not likely that all identical anyway. And then you just write down the number of each of the species you've seen in each section according to what you've seen, which I think is self-explanatory. There are two species on the form that I pretty much guarantee you are not going to see because wall brown and Scotch Argus are on your form somewhere down here near the bottom. You're not going to see them, so don't worry about it. There's also a space at the bottom, so you can write down things that you probably will see that are not on your form. So there are things in the Chilterns which are not on the form, which is a generic for the whole country, but you will see other species that are not on the form. You just write them in at the bottom. Uh, Saturday, we're on to Saturday. I've finished all that. Perhaps I ought to stop. I'll pause for a minute. Are there any questions? Or is everybody's mind now melted with all that detail? Just a point, I guess, from, from me, Nick. There's, there's a lot of information here. When it comes to anything to do with the website, putting your routes up, um, putting your data online, getting into your account, all that kind of stuff, that's what I'm here to do to help you do. 
So when you come to do this, and it was a long time ago when Nick told me about this in March, now it's June when you're putting the data in, but don't panic about it. I can walk you through it all. I can I can help you through. So so don't panic if it's all sounding like a, a lot of processy things. It's there, but actually, I'm I'm here to help. Yeah, I, I'm absolutely sure most people listening to this before they go out walking think, oh my God, how on earth is anyone supposed to remember all that? But when you actually get out there and do it, it isn't that difficult, but there is a lot to listen to tonight, I'm afraid. So what are we going to do on Saturday? We're going to go out with a printed sheet, just the one that we've been looking at here, and we're going to walk a section that I've set up. So here you see some people walking in a farm where they were preparing to do surveys in this area of, uh, during the summer after this walk, which was also in March, you can tell from their coats and the vegetation. And I'd set up that there were coloured pegs, and that's what it says here, in the hedge, on the floor, around about them, and the people had to go down and spot them and then tell me whether they thought the peg was inside their imaginary five metre box or not. Relatively simple. And then at the end of the walk, I stop them and say, and how much sun was there? And that's when they go, oh, yeah, I was supposed to remember that too, wasn't I? So it's just a way of practicing it. And the whole thing becomes much clearer when we go out and do it, because you can ask questions on the hoop, as it were, and just somehow doing it, actually physically walking it, makes it so much easier to understand. Where are we going to be on Saturday? Well. This is the village of Longwick. So we've perhaps come from Kimball to get here, or we've maybe come out from Risborough to get to this road, because Risborough is just off the map here. And, or we could have come from um, Longwick in this direction, but we're coming along this road, which I always think of as being the Lower Ignealed Way, but I see here it's called Chinna Road. Anyway, that's the Lower Ignealed Way to me. And we're gonna turn off to the north, towards pitch green. And then we're gonna take this little fork here up to the farm here at Holly Green. Now, although this says sand pit lane in the instructions, this is sand pit lane here. So if you find yourself on sand pit lane and can't see Holly Green Farm, it's because sand pit lane is actually here on Chapel Lane. So this is a bit closer. There's the Lower Ignil Way again, that's um, Kimball in that direction and Longwick in this direction and we're turning to the north towards Pitcock which is this area and off on the left here or the west to Chapel Lane and up or you could go right to the top of course and come back in this way but this is the farm we're going to Holly Green Farm. Just just on that point Nick sorry the far, this this is a very large active dairy farm so the farmer specifically asked if we can come, not go down the sandpit lane, but come in that left fork and into the, the bottom chapel lane. Yeah. yeah, the initial road. So there'll be on the on the where you've got LN of lane on the map, there'll be a little sign pointing you down to take the left hand fork and take you in. There you come down the long farm drive and pass the farmhouse for obvious reasons. Who doesn't want lots of people driving through the um, the yard with all the cows and and all the machinery and things? So we'll we'll, we'll signpost that on the morning. And there you are. Look. That's the map that you sent me today, Nick. Yeah. So take left fork here. That's where the sign will be. Assuming that Nick gets there with a sign before you do. <laughs> and we go down the single track and we're parking on this, the western side in this space here. So we, we're not to go onto this side of the farm on the eastern side, because that's where all the dairy works going on. Um, I did say you might well see butterflies outside the box and think them worth recording. I would give one tip here, that either put them on pen and paper and send that list to somebody if that's the way you like to work, or use your mobile phone and the iRecord Butterflies um, app, your phone, it's completely free. You can get it on both the Apple and the Android systems. And it looks like this when you open it, it tells you what's flying around in your area. This is a slightly strange one that it gives us those to us, but anyway, it doesn't make any difference. It will show you what's flying in the area where you're standing on that day. And if you want to record things, you press this button. I'm just going to go back again. 
press this button here that says record, which allows you to make a recording. Now, something about this that I don't like very much. I like the whole thing a great deal, but this is the weakness, I think, in the system. If you just press record once, it will allow you to record a single species. If you hold down record, so you don't just put your finger on it and take it straight off, hold it down and click it, then it allows you to record more things. So this is a single click, and it will let you record one species, and in this case, it was an orange tip. But if you hold that down and hold it longer, it then asks you to make a list of everything you've seen at that location. And the location will automatically populate using the GPS in your phone if you've given it permission to do so. And that makes it a lot easier. So if you're walking your trans, uh, your wider countryside butterfly survey, and you see something you believe is interesting outside the five meter box, then you can record that too, but not as part of the survey separately in the I record. And the same goes for moths. You can record moths that way too. I would suggest though, in the case of moths, um, you can do it on your phone. I find it a bit difficult on my phone. So I just make a note of those on paper and I put them into iRecord by searching for the subset of moths from the recording submenu. And you can do that when you get home. And if you prefer, put them on paper and sending them off with the county moth recorder, that's possible too. Um, the only thing I need to tell you about that is that the county moth recorders might be a bit suspicious if you tell them you've seen some moths and they don't know who you are and how good you are. So it's a good idea to have a photo and they will definitely want to know which life stage you're reporting. Now you might think it's obvious you'll be telling them it's an adult, but they don't like to make that assumption. So they will want to know that too. Okay, as I said at the beginning, all this data you're collecting, I genuinely believe it's fun to collect it, but it is useful. It's really useful. And come back to the last point that I just made. It's supposed to be fun. You know, we, I, I get a great deal of pleasure from doing this. I know there's a lot to listen to, and I'm sorry it's gone on so long. Um, when we're there on Saturday, it will take probably about the same length of time to actually go through this again in the field. But I think it will stick. You'll understand what you're doing much better than listening to me tonight, I hope. OK, thank you. I don't know if there are any questions or whether um, Nick needs to make any other observations. No, thank you very much. Now, we'll just reiterate a number of points there, really. I guess don't panic. <laughs> if you don't feel you remembered all this kind of stuff, that's my job to help you get ready with your squares, your routes, your any kind of survey questions, as you say, Nick, once you've done it for real in the field, um, will be a peg, not a butterfly on Saturday. It will make a bit more sense. You'll have a first go by the end of your fourth, fifth, sixth visit. It will all become second nature to you. So uh, don't don't panic at this stage. Um, it is great fun. I love it. I'm a birder, but doing butterfly surveys is a whole different kind of world, and it's a bit more sociable as well than bird survey. So it's good fun. Um, and go out there and, and enjoy. So so that that's going to keep going there. And actually, once you say the national schemes, incredibly important nick from a national perspective they all all the data feeds into national trends and government indicators and and all kinds of things same applies to us in the chilterns where i'm tracking the impact but this data helps us understand what's happening in the chilterns and it will be used for a whole range of different kind of uses that we can talk about as we go through the, the project itself so you're doing a massively important job hopefully having fun and exploring some new areas that probably you wouldn't ordinarily get to go and um, go and explore so hopefully it's a that's the, the overall uh, rounded package. Um, before we talk about Saturday and details for Saturday, um, there probably are a number of questions I'm sure running through your mind. Um, either feel free to ask them now of Nick or maybe pick them up on Saturday, but we've got a bit more time. If you want to, to fire any questions Nick's way, please do so now. Don't worry about hands, just unmute and, and, and ask away, please. Yeah, I've got a question about the temperatures and the time frames. Um, yes. Last year I was out transecting and some days it was already sort of way up in the 20s by about 10 o'clock. Um, so obviously the temperature was okay, the daylight was okay. I wonder if we're definitely bound to only starting at like quarter to 10 
if it's possible to start earlier than that, if the weather is particularly hot and sunny? Well, no, John, you're not, because remember, we're, we're counting insects and they don't necessarily behave like we do according to the temperature. So it may well be that they don't move because the sun isn't high enough in the sky, despite it being warm enough. Right. Some, some species do, but others are very definitely going to just sit tight until they think the, the sun has climbed high enough in the sky. Um, right, because obviously the sun is quite high in the sky at, say, half past eight in July and August, but it's a lot lower in the sky probably at quarter to 11 in, in April or May. Well, that may be true, but I expect the butterflies that fly in, in the middle of summer know. I, I, I'm not going to... I'm, I'm trying to guess the reasons. I shall, I shall stop trying to guess the reasons why we have to stick to the yeah. um, guidance that we're given, because if people don't stick to it, that's when it breaks down and we get mm. results which, are um, unfortunately, they'll be declared non-valid. So I think it's because they want to be absolutely sure that all the species are definitely going to be on the wing, so you won't count some more, right. more easily than others. But I don't actually know that some species won't fly um, at half past eight. I can't tell you, but I'm guessing that's the reason. Yeah. No, I just wondered because there was days when I was out last summer and it was just absolutely horrible. <laughs> it was so hot in some of the um, some of the areas where the you know like the forest trails are absorbing the heat, um, and the you know surrounding trees and shrubs is stopping there being any breeze it was just unbearable in some of these places at you know sort of like 12 o'clock one o'clock in the day yeah I, I exactly think, sorry i'm going to say there's one, one one beauty of the wcbs is if it is a day like that then you don't need to go because you can mm. try again a week later when it when the weather yeah. almost certainly will have changed yeah, I, I had the same experience, John, last year, and I, I think the, so. There's there's that answer, Nick, on the but also please don't put yourself at risk. Don't go out in thirty degree heat in raw sunshine and end up keeling over dehydration. There's there's um, reiterate your point from earlier. Don't don't risk it. So I guess better off yeah. hold on for another day than um than, than put yourself at risk from that perspective as well. The last we want is to be keeling over. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine most days, if you can start at quarter to ten, then it shouldn't be too bad. But um, obviously, these are transects, and some of them are, are quite longer, and some transects lead into another transect, which makes it quite a long session. Yeah, uh, but we're not, unless I'm wrong, we're not walking any transects, are we, on the, or tracking the impact, Nick Mariner? No, no, it's all, w, it's all the two times. Yeah. It's all no, WCBS. I just, I, I just saw sort of latched on to this and I was I was watching it and I you know it's very similar to transecting. So I thought I'd ask questions about the uh, the temperature and what the you know sort of the rules okay. were and if there was any flexibility. Um well there is a little bit because they yeah. do say you can go that hour earlier in the middle yeah. of summer if it's really hot, but that's the most that they give. Right. Okay, that's fine. I just, I just wanted to clarify, really. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank Thanks, you. John. Anybody else got anything you want to pick up while we're here, or take, feel free to Probably throw away on Saturday morning. Meal. Any other questions, anyone? So, in which case, let's take that as a no more questions for now. So, really, the key thing then is for Saturday, um, half past ten kickoff. Um, we have. Who knows what I've not checked the forecast for the weekend, but we've got access to um, to the meeting room at the farm, so we could meet there and have a brew and a bit of cake maybe before we start. Um, if it throws it down and rain, it we can always revert indoors. But I guess most of Saturday we'll be out practicing this for real, um, so we can meet. We can always dip back in. There are toilets um, in the meeting room, so we, we're okay for toilets. We can make a cup of tea and coffee. We can get a bit of cake, and then we can head out onto the farm and um, and practice this for real. And I'm sure there'll be other questions having having done it for real, and it'll be, what, by 10.30, probably away by 12.30, you think, Nick? Oh, I, I would imagine that would be, you yeah. know, even if we go back and have another piece of cake and another cup of tea, I think 12.30, because so, yeah. I wasn't planning to make anybody walk even a kilometre. We might walk 
200 meters of survey but we once you've walked 200 meters of one section it's just a matter of them repeating that in the next section so we're not going to do yeah. several sections we're going to do one section and understand how we would fill in the form for that yeah. one section and then all the other sections will be done in the same way yeah sounds good and then who knows if the weather's okay we might even see a butterfly you never know if it's a bit warm on saturday then a good chance we might find a brimstone and one or two others so yeah yeah there was somebody on tracking the impacts whatsapp had seen a peacock today so yeah saturday is yeah. entirely possible i think it's yeah. supposed to be just about warm enough i'm not sure it's going to be sunny though yeah we'll find out on saturday. well we will <laughs> we will excellent um so we'll see you saturday Thanks that's okay much, thank you nick Thanks very, everybody very for joining this evening. Have a good rest of the evening. Yep. See you Saturday. Um, Bye. We'll see you Saturday morning about half past ten. Thanks all. Bye.